Bill Blakey is the longest continuous serving member in the current parliament, but he's also an ordained minister, plays the bagpipes, and has four children to keep him on his toes. Coming up next on Beyond Politics, my interview with a living, breathing Canadian institution, Bill Blakey. Bill Blakey, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Beyond Politics. It's really great to have a chat with you. Thank you for having me. So you were ordained as a minister, and then you decided to run for Parliament. That's right. What happened along the path there that made you choose one vocation over another? Because they're pretty different. Well, they're pretty different, though, though uh, you know, they both uh, have an element of a calling to, uh, to them, and certainly in my own life. I was involved in the church all my life mm -hmm. and involved in politics one way or another all my life. So I always like to describe it as having a kind of a two-track uh, existence. Uh, and um, even in terms of ordination, I was ordained in 1978. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, in 1977, I was actually became, a, I was already a candidate when I became ordained. So, uh, you know, uh, but there was a history of this in, in Winnipeg. It wasn't like I was doing something out of the ordinary. I mean, at the time that I became the NDP candidate for the new riding of Winnipeg Birds Hill, mm -hmm. we already had a sitting incumbent NDP member of parliament called Stanley Knowles, who was a United Church minister, uh, you know, and had been on a leave of absence since 1942. <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, I wasn't exactly doing a new thing, right. uh, at least in the Winnipeg uh, context. And uh, so... Uh, and of course, there was no guarantee that I would, I would win. It was right. something that I was going to do and see what happened. And I was running against a conservative incumbent. And uh, at that time, uh, the conservatives looked like they were, you know, going to form a government, which they ultimately did in '79. So it was more a, a kind of a, a run, and uh, uh, because I also felt called to, uh, yeah. to political life. Of course, I didn't know that I would. Win, win. The, win the election of 79 <laughs> and, you know, nine elections later that I'd still, still be here be and basically, you know, didn't get to practice much as a, as a United Church minister, but uh, I'm still very active in the church. I just, you know, returned from uh, a weekend in, in Halifax where I was preaching yesterday morning, you know. You know, I want to actually follow that, that um, train of thought because we get very nervous, I find, when we talk about faith and politics together because we always think of it as being um, a right of center thing to do. But you you actually are quite passionate about the idea of faith and politics and you have a different approach about it. Can you yeah, talk well, about that a bit? Sure. I mean, because there is this older tradition in Canadian politics of a connection between faith and politics on the left. And it's really only in the last uh, 25, 30 years since the rise of the so-called religious right in, in the United States, the moral majority, Jerry Falwell, et cetera, culminating, if you like, in the, in the, you know, the uh, politics of the, the current uh, American president, uh, that people have come to uh, associate uh, religion and politics and the connection between them as being a sort of a, uh, a priori, a kind of a right-wing thing. And the fact of the matter is, is that there's a, a much older uh, tradition in Canadian and American politics, whereby either on the left, or for that matter, in the sort of liberal center or red Tory center, or whatever you want to call it, a lot of uh, people have uh, been acting out of their their religious convictions all along, and sometimes the so-called small L liberal secular world that uh, the religious right sets itself against is actually something that was created by a Christian activist in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one of the things that I'm interested in doing more of uh, is reclaiming and reaffirming the fact that that, that older uh, tradition within Canadian politics, are, and there are people doing this in American politics as well, uh, reminding people that there's more than one way to be uh, faithful and in the political arena. Sure, you know, sure. So. That's a very interesting, uh, but a big job too. Yeah. It's a big job. Because well, it's a big stereotype to overturn. Absolutely. And what I'm hoping is that at the same time as we sort of reaffirm this older tradition, and it, not in some uncritical way, it has to, it has to change itself as time goes on, 
but uh, but also I'm hoping that the that at least some on the so-called uh, religious and political right, but particularly the re the religious conservative small c conservative universe will uh, move on, if you like, and get beyond their own entrapment in a few in in, in a hand, handful of issues, and see that you know if you read the Bible carefully, uh, there's much more in there about poverty. Uh, about you know how we treat each other economically, um, there's a whole lot in there that would point to you know having a much stronger sort of environmental consciousness, preserving creation. I mean, all these kinds of things. And I think there's a younger, at least I hope this mm. is my hope, but there's some evidence for it that there's a, a younger generations of, of uh, evangelical Christians that are coming along that are saying you know uh, maybe faith is bigger than uh, what we've been led to believe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you for indulging me because I was really interested yeah. in that aspect of it. And now I want to take us back to election yeah. night, 1979. Right. What happened when you knew that you were going to win? Were you completely shocked or did you have a sense that it was going to happen? Well, I didn't, I didn't uh, really, uh, I had a sense that it was possible, but not that it was going to happen. And I remember actually uh, one of my favorite stories was on the, I guess it was the Sunday. The election was on the Tuesday after the Monday of the long weekend. And I had canvassed like 70 polls or whatever. I mean, I just uh, really worked quite hard and I went to uh, a friend's house who was the MLA at that time uh, in, in Transcona, Wilson Parasook, and I said, Willie, they want me to canvas this afternoon, but I just can't knock on another door. Can I hide out here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And he said, yeah, come on in. He said, I think you're going to win anyway, you know. I said, what do you mean? You think so? He said, yeah, I, th I think you're going to win. And that was the first time that it really kind of dawned on me that this, this, wasn't, might happen. This, this wasn't just for next time or wasn't just a learning experience. And uh, Although I did have this sense that the writing had this potential to be a good NDP writing because it was a brand new writing, even though it was a Tory incumbent. Yeah. He was running in a portion of his old writing. The new part... Uh, was my hometown, Transcoyne, which for 60 years had been part of St. Boniface and had always been liberal with very few exceptions. Sure. And so there was this new uh, convergence of uh, NDP possibilities, if you like, which I, th I thought when I sought the nomination, but you know, others didn't because, I mean, I got the nomination by acclamation when I was 26 years old because I think basically people felt Whatever. Let him do the hard work. You he's know, not going to win Let him anyways. run. He's not going to win anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so now, I was very, you know, but I, I was very, ex extremely excited. Yeah. But then there was also a part of me was sort of like, okay, you know. God, we what won, have I we done? Beat him, we beat him now. You know, do I go back to work tomorrow? Oh, no, <laughs> no, you never go back to work. You go to Ottawa and you start a whole new job. You know? Now, you, yeah. you were married at the time. Yeah, yeah. How long had you been married? Uh, we were married, uh, Brenda and I, in 73, so. Okay. So yeah. you, and was she supportive of the decision to run? Yes, think? yeah. I mean, you know, she uh, she knew that I was a sort of a, a political animal, and I think uh, uh, she was probably, uh, when we're to be frank, she was probably happier with the notion of being an MP's wife than a minister's, you know? Yeah, because <laughs> then they're all coming certain... to your house all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I don't think either of us, you know, had a strong sense of what all it would have Involve. If she uh, had known, do you think she'd have gone for it, that she was going to be alone for major portions of her yeah. year raising four kids? <laughs> well, I'm sure she would have in the sense of supporting me, but it's, yeah. it certainly was, there was times when it was very difficult for her. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, especially after when you get one kid, two kids, three kids, four kids, sure. and they're all like 10 and under, uh, you come back. You've had a great week in Ottawa. You met this important person, that important person. You participated in this debate. You've had a great, you know, you've had a great week, and you want to, you know, kind of talk about talk it. about it. And she just wants you to do the dishes. Yeah. And be quiet. <laughs> yeah, you take, her, take over. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. yeah, or you've been eating out all week, and you can't wait to be home, and she's For been nice home, home all week, and meal. she wants to go out. You yeah. know what I mean? So I mean, it does. It sets up. Uh, uh, that kind of uh, situation, but obviously we uh, we survived it. And did your kids mind it, or did they like it? Well, I mean, my kids never do anything else, right? So, yeah. I mean, they've all of them. I think that's a big bonus. Rebecca was eleven months old when I was elected. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's a and, big bonus uh, not to know anything else. So it's just she, your life. They know that's just their life. I mean, the funny uh, the funny story. Rebecca, I think, was in kindergarten or grade one, and she came home and she said to her mom, "You know, I was talking to this girl." Uh, they have a really kind of uh, 
odd family. And uh, Brenda said, what do you mean? She said, well, her father comes home for supper every night. <laughs> She thought this was really strange because <laughs> I just go home on the weekends from Ottawa, you know. And what but but they, you know, I mean, they don't feel. I think I can say with uh, authority that you know, they they're glad that they led the life that that they did, and uh, they feel connected to the life of the country and to and to all kinds of things that they wouldn't have mm -hmm. been connected to if they if I hadn't been an MP, and of course if I hadn't been one for so long. So sure. you know, yeah. Have you enjoyed it? No, oh, I've enjoyed it immensely. Yeah. I mean, and I'm kind of sorry to, to not run again, but uh, it's it's time to to move on. Why did you decide that it's time to move on? Was there something specific that happened that made you think that way, or did you just realize, you know, what it's? Well, I mean, I just think uh, after a while, it's. I mean, I'll be 29 years in May, and who knows? I might get 30 years in sure. be before this parliament is over. And uh, most people don't get to stick around this long anyway. They either start later in life and retire. Uh, before they get 30 years in or they get defeated or, or whatever. So it's not like, uh, um, well, it is like I'm in a kind of an unusual uh, position. Mm -hmm. And But the back and forth and, you know, and I've just, we're just at a position in our lives as a couple that we just want to have more freedom and flexibility. And I don't tend to retire from the cause. I hope to do some work at the, I've been appointed as a, adjunct prof at the University of Winnipeg in the theology and oh, department great. and the political studies department. And so I hope to do a little stuff there, a place to work from as well mm -hmm. as at, mm -hmm. and uh, what, whatever else. There's lots of interesting international work Very much uh, so. available in terms of democracy building. And, and that's uh, something you that you've been interested in for yeah, a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there anywhere specific that you, you think you'd like to go? Is there a particular region of the world that's always been of specific interest to you and you think, well, I could do something there? I don't have a, a real kind of cause celeb in that regard, yeah. you know? I yeah. mean, I'm just going to be open to whatever uh, presents itself. Well, at the same time, you know, I, I do notice that when you say you're not going to run again or you're retired, people say, well, you know, can you do this? Yeah. Could you be on this? Normally you do for that? free. So, yeah, so. yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I can just careful. say, well, you know, I'm just kind of biding my time. I don't want to say yes to the first few things that come along until I, until I have a better sense of what's out there. Is it um, awkward being in a minority situation right now where you don't know, you said you're not running again, yeah. but you really honestly have no sense of what that means. You don't know, if, as you say, yeah. if it means May of this year so that it's yeah. 29 years or that you're going to get a full 30 years yeah. in the House. Yeah. Is that awkward? It is awkward. I mean, it's not just awkward for me. I think there's about 20 or more MPs that are in that, mm -hmm. in that position. Uh, I mean, I announced on March the 15th last year that I wasn't running because it looked like there was an election going to happen. I mean, the Conservatives had their war room up and running. Everybody was on red alert, and it didn't happen. Uh, I forget exactly what the political event or poll was that killed the idea. But so, you know, I've had a year of this sort of already living in the future in my mind, right. while at the same time being very tied to the House as the, as the Deputy Speaker. It's not as if I've been, you know, I've been fading away. I've been actually been here uh, as much as I've ever been. Yeah. yeah so. Well, and, uh, and you're the Dean of the House yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. That's a pretty... That's right, yeah. what, does that mean that you have any particular responsibilities, or does that... No, it, it doesn't. I mean, the only actual responsibility that comes with it yeah. is um, you conduct the election of the Speaker. Right. And you know, once that's done, that's done on the first day of the parliament. So you don't have any responsibilities. Uh, uh, the only thing that comes with it is, yeah, it's a very kind of intangible thing. Sometimes a little bit of, you know, deference if you're expressing an opinion about parliament. You know. Are uh, you held up as a model for new MPs as to how someone that they can turn to if they have questions about the house or? I don't know if, you, I, you know, I, that would have to be, uh, you know, something that somebody else did. But I mean, certainly, I, I have. I mean, I am a kind of, uh, you know, it's hard to think of myself this way, but nevertheless, I do have a kind of institutional memory so that other people don't have. Absolutely. Yeah, so I can uh, be a source sometimes of historical perspective yeah. or warning. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened the last time it looked like this? Do yeah. you find that people <laughs> come to you to ask you those types of questions? Sometimes, right yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know. All parties? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
How has how has Parliament changed since you've been there? Because you must have seen, well, you, you have seen yeah. some quite dramatic changes. Well, the biggest change politically, of course, was the change that happened in 93 right. when, uh, uh, and from an NDP point of view, you know, we lost party status, as did the, as did the Progressive Conservatives, and uh, we, uh, that was a terrible time, one of the worst times in my political life between 93 and 97. I call it the Babylonian Parliament, you know, when we were in exile. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and, but not only that, not just from a, our, you know, an NDP partisan point of view, but I think from the point of view of Parliament, uh, you had two parties that came in, the Reform Party and the Bloc. Neither one of them had any institutional memory. Uh, and so a lot of things changed at that point. Uh, and uh, it's almost like there's two different political cultures. There's sort of pre-93 and post-93, you know? And uh, uh, what has but that a lot brought? of things, pardon? What has that brought? Sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but when you say it's um, that there, there were almost two political cultures, is it that there's um, a lack of something post-93 beyond the institutional memory? Is there a lack of respect for the institution, or is there... Well, I mean, the, the 93 campaign, in a way, was, uh, even though the Liberals won it, uh, and they, they didn't in, in engage in that, but there was a lot of, there was a buildup in the early 90s, a kind of anti-politician, anti-institutional, anti, anti uh, that the whole system was, um, uh, you know, in need of some great uh, reform, uh, and, no pun intended, and... Uh, you know, I think that uh, a, a lot of uh, baby went out with the bathwater yeah. uh, at that time. Uh, but, uh, you know, then there are other things that are just more cumulative and sequential uh, the, that have happened over time in terms of changes to Parliament or some changes that were attempted and never really... But then one thing I've found is that whatever kind of parliamentary changes or reform that you get, there's always some kind of unintended consequence mm -hmm. that you don't see... Expect. Yeah. You, that you don't expect, and so you you either get both what you expect and what you don't, or sometimes you just get what you didn't <laughs> expect. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. Your daughter Rebecca yeah. ran, and uh, when she told you that she was planning to run, and against yeah. the sitting prime minister at the time, mm -hmm. Paul Martin, no less, mm -hmm. how did you feel? Were you happy given the experiences that you've had in Parliament that she was going to try? Uh, what you had tried in many ways, or were you worried for her? What were your emotions? Well, certainly, I mean, she was, I mean, I never tried to run against the sitting prime minister, <laughs> and, and I ran in a riding tricky task. where the NDP <laughs> had a strong uh, provincial tradition and even uh, elements of a strong federal tradition. So um, when she said, well, she, she was thinking of running in Montreal, uh, if I remember correctly, I said, well, then what? you might as well just run a little Sally Martin go after the big guy. Said, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Well, you know. <laughs> and that's exactly what she did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. You know, and, and of course we were in, in need of candidates. And ironically, now she's in charge of recruiting Fine candidates. candidates. Yeah. <laughs> Doing a pretty good job, you know? So, yeah. 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 But uh, no, I didn't, certainly didn't discourage her. Uh, uh, you know, she yeah. went into it with her eyes open. She knew it it was going to be quite different than the campaign she was used to back in Winnipeg, Transcona. Sure. But, you know? And all of your kids are active in some way, aren't they? I mean, they've, they've all, uh, your kids are all doing something within their communities. Uh, yeah, they're all active, each in their own, uh, in their own way, uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, the looking, trying to be agents of social change and social right. justice. Uh, um, my daughter, uh, Jessica, teaches in an inner city school and very active in trying to improve the lives of her students, uh, not just as in an educational sense, but and uh, my son works at the, for the Manitoba NDP government, and uh, and of course my youngest daughter is at university. But right. uh, that's probably when they're most active, but, isn't uh, it? <laughs> she's always involved in, yeah. in a, there are in no a borders half a dozen different causes at any given time. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, isn't that fun? Yeah. So, do you have any free time? Do you actually get time off ever? Well, yeah, I do, and I mean, I always made time. Uh, I was not the you know, I was not the sort of MP to kind of browse the newspapers to look for things that I could just show up at yeah. uh, uninvited. I yeah. mean, if I was invited, You'd go. I, I would go. But I, you know, I consciously made time for my for my kids and for my family to 
uh, extended family because both my wife's parents and my parents uh, were in the same community, and that was a great help, you know, sure. to, uh, to have that family support. To, yeah, and and for my kids because you know we had the debate at one point: do we move to Ottawa or mm -hmm. do we stay mm -hmm. uh, in the community? And we stayed in the community, and I think that was uh, the right thing to do. Although right. it didn't, you know, it did mean probably more uh, commuting. But so be it, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I've always uh, I've tried to lead a kind of a reasonably well-rounded uh, life. Do you think your constituents ever begrudged you for taking that time or not showing up at their event, or do you think that constituents, on a basic level, respect and understand that from their MP? I, I don't. I never had any sort of negative feedback. I think because I did go to whatever people wanted me to go yeah. to, whatever I knew they wanted me to be at. Yeah. Right, uh, and uh, uh, so no, I you know yeah. I think the, the the relationship between me and my constituents was pretty good. There's always this, you know, a few that that uh, yeah. don't like you for one reason or another, but that goes or with a the whole territory. Bunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe not in your own making. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've heard that you actually play the bagpipes. That's right. Yeah. No, playing the pipes has been a big part of my life right from... Has it really? When yeah. did you start that and how? Uh, well I was 10 uh, and uh, well I, yeah just when I turned 10, 1961 mm -hmm. and uh, my grandfather Blakey uh, had been a piper, he was a piper, a piper in the First World War with the first Canadian Mounted Rifles wow. and uh, he sent me his uh, chanter which is the thing you learn the pipes on and said if I wanted to learn the pipes that way would pleased him greatly and here was a chanter and it had been actually the chanter that he'd had with him through the trenches in World War One, and uh, so I decided that I wanted to take up the uh, pipes and my dad knew a machinist in the shop my dad was, worked in the railway and, and he knew a fellow machinist actually who was actually from Scotland uh, who uh, was willing to come to our house on Saturday mornings and get me started and Boy, so that I did play the piano. That must have made for a happy household when you were learning. For a while, uh, I, I had played the piano. You know, yeah. I, I always remember when I told my very sort of distinguished elderly piano teacher that I was giving up piano, and she said, "Why?" I said, "Well, I'm going to I'm gonna take up the bagpipes." And it was sort of like I had said I was giving up civilization for barbarism or something. You know. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I took the pipes and I ended Did up. Did you like them from the start? From or the did start, you find yeah. them tough? No, no, from the start. I mean, they were tough. Now, the heart, you know, there's, it's not easy to play the pipes, and yeah. there's a period where you're, particularly when you're trying to learn the pipes themselves, uh, you know, getting that coordination between your arm and the bag and, you know, your breathing and everything yes. else. But, uh, so that's a difficult time, and they don't always sound that great. Yeah, I was going to say. At that time, so how many siblings did you have? You need patience, uh, or yeah, patient who needs parents. patience though? You, you patient, or you? No, your <laughs> yeah. parents, you know, for listening to it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> did you have many siblings? Were yes, I have, I have two brothers and a sister. Okay, you know, so and my, one of my uh, my brother uh, played the pipes as well later. Oh on. boy! And two of my kids played the pipes too. Really? Yeah, Jessica and Dan. God, so, so you know what? You yeah. know how they say that it all comes back at you. You when they when your kids took up the pipes, you must have been thrilled. But boy, those because it's it's a any music is tough to listen to when it's played by a novice. Yeah. So well, we didn't mind. You didn't mind. I don't know. Brenda did sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when you're trying to sleep in on yeah. the morning. No, uh, well they uh, you know they played in bands and that's, yeah. it was a great and I I played in. Uh, First of all, a scout band, and then a cadet band, and then a militia. I was in the Queen's Old Cameron Handlers. Huh. And even in Ottawa here for a time, I played with the Air Command Band. You know, Isn't that pipes something? And drums, and it was always a kind of a, an element of my life that I really enjoyed. In fact, I hope, maybe it won't happen, but you know, when, when I'm free from the parliamentary uh, wheel, so to speak, that maybe I can you know, find a pipe band in Winnipeg and play with, play with a band again, because it's hard to beat marching down the street full, oh. full dress. God, I but, love the bagpipes you know. too, and and it's and you know what, you're in good company. You have the queen. Yeah, yeah, her she pipes does. Too, yeah. So, and I, the highlight of my life, as far as piping was concerned, was when I was 19, and I, I was part of a Canadian Army band that played in the Edinburgh Tattoo. Wow, uh, wouldn't yeah. that have been exciting? Yeah. So that was doesn't get much better than that from the point of view of being a piper. Piper. Yeah. And you're a big fan of Robbie Burns too. 
Yes, that was something that, you know, I mean, I was aware of uh, Burns and all that coming up in a kind of pipe band and tradition, Scottish uh, family on my dad's side, but uh, I actually became most acquainted with Burns through Tommy Douglas. Yeah. Uh, because uh, when, I, when I came here in 1979, Tommy didn't run in 79, so we were never actually colleagues in the house, but he was still sort of around, if you, if you like, and uh, at one point there were a number of us in the NDP caucus. Uh, Ian Deans, Ian Waddell, Neil Young, uh, and them, uh, they're all Scots themselves, and we, we said, well, uh, maybe we should put on a Burns night, and so we did, and we asked Tommy to come and, and uh, give the toast of the immortal memory, and it was after hearing uh, Tommy give the toast of the immortal memory, which is a long speech, sometimes, sometimes short, but Tommy was, it was a long, long. speech, but it was a good speech, <laughs> and you didn't want it to end, you know? Yeah. And when I realized the extent to which that actually Burns had been a, was a sort of a formative element uh, uh, for him, and upon you know research and reflection and talking to others, the extent to which Burns is actually part of the social democratic labor trade union uh, egalitarian tradition in Scotland, you know yeah. that. Uh, uh, there's a lot of Burns poetry is about you know putting down the high and mighty and making sure everybody knows that they all put their pants on the same way. You know what I mean? I've heard yeah. that you're, from yeah. your staffers that you have been known to quote Robbie Burns uh, in the office. So. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, 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 or in the house for that matter. Yes, yeah. true enough. <laughs> <laughs> have you eaten haggis? Oh, often. 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 Yes, yeah, wow. yeah. I admire you for it. Uh, well, it's, <laughs> it can be quite good. Yeah. I mean, you know. So. When done right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like pipes. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. you talked about uh, low point in the house, yeah. that period between yeah. 93 and 97. Was there a high point too? Did you have a time that was really a, or do you have a memory of a time that was really a good, important time for you in the house, personally? Yeah, well, I mean, I've had lots of good, you know, good uh, times over that whole period and you know perhaps it's a function of uh, just human nature but I also think it's more to do with the political times that the early 80s uh, were really it was before what I would describe as a sort of corporate counterattack on what had been achieved in the post-war era really began in earnest and so we were still as young people coming into Parliament building as you know from a NDP point of view, building uh, on the sort of social democratic consensus that had developed in the post, uh, post-war post Canada. So we were still doing things like, you know, the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, the Canada Health Act, all these things happened in that, in that, in, in the early 80s. Mm. And uh, so you felt that you were building. Uh, from 84 on, I always felt that we were on the defensive, uh, that we were uh, we were trying to add to that, but at the same time, we were much more caught in a in a in a political uh, context uh, with the whole sort of you know Reagan Thatcher Moroni deregulation, free trade, privatization. It was a whole it's a whole sort of package mm. that some people think is very good, but you know we didn't, yeah. and I don't, and uh, and uh, and we felt uh, uh, from there on in that we were on, on the defensive, and uh, to some degree we still are. Mm -hmm. And so then you get kind of stereotyped. Instead of being the agent of change that uh, people on the left were always seen to be, we, we almost, because we were defending so many things that were now under attack that hadn't been, uh, we came to be seen as almost uh, uh, conservative folk who were always trying to hang on to the, something in the past that needed to be changed. Uh, or done away with as a result of this new ideology. So it was a, much more frustrating than I anticipated it would be. You know, you kind of come out in the late 70s and you want to build on everything sure. that's been done and you end up in this, uh, spending most of your life in a kind of a defensive uh, posture. Well, I've, certainly I've known you for yeah. almost my entire life and I think Parliament will be uh, much less for not having you uh, in the House of Commons, and I really appreciate that you would take the time to come and chat today on Beyond Politics before you head off into your next big adventure in life. Well, thanks for having me. Thank it's you great very much, Mr. Blakey. You.